Happy National Math Storytelling Day to all who celebrate. On today's Locked on Predators, we're going to take a look at some statistics and what that math does and doesn't tell us about the Nashville Predators this season. Your Locked on Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to the Locked On Predators podcast. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We are your free daily Nashville Predators podcast. We're a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Want to kick off this Wednesday episode welcoming any first time listeners and our everydayers and of course a special hump day hello to our Locked On Predators insiders. We appreciate your support. We love that we get to spend a little bit of your day with you. I'm Ann Kimmel. I am a writer with Penalty Box Radio and my friends, I have a partner in crime. You do. I'm Emma Lingen and I'm the Predators site editor and reporter for the Hockey News. Well, the Predators have put in another hard day's work at Ford Ice Center yesterday. We're going to tell you what Andrew Brunette had the team working on. We're also going to give you some important injury updates. Plus, it's a big day here at the Lockdown Predators podcast. It is National Math Storytelling Day. We are going to take a look at some numbers that may or may not predict the storyline of the 2024-25 season here in Nashville. Before we dive into all of that good stuff, do want to let you know today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. All right, Emma, little training camp update from Tuesday. Uh, The list is down to two groups. Um, We have group A, which is basically who you would kind of consider your starters, your usual suspects, with the additions of Mark Del Geizo, Zachary LaRue, Ozzie Weisblatt, and Adam Willsby. We're playing with kind of the, the top guys which I thought was really interesting. One of the things that I love seeing yesterday is that we got to see some power play work. That first power play unit, y'all, is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's Roman Yossi. It's Steven Stamkos. It's Philip Forsberg, Jonathan Marcheseau, Ryan O'Reilly. The second unit in practice yesterday, Brady Shea, Colton Sissons, Luke Evangelista, Phil Tomasino, and Tommy Novak. I thought it was interesting, Emma, to see Shea on the power play because when Barry Trotz talks about specialized special teams positions, automatically I'm thinking Shea on the penalty kill. But there he was. Yeah, I kind of had the same thought. But then, you know, thinking about it, uh, you got to remind yourself, still training camp, we're still trying everything. He... Brady Shea has spent time on the power play in Carolina before. So it's something that he has done. And so you just want to do whatever is going to make the most sense and what's going to make the team better. You know, I think it's also thinking about Ryan McDonough was usually the, the, the quarterback for that second unit. Now he's gone. And if you're looking at Brady Shea as kind of a, a one for one replacement for Ryan McDonough, then, you know, that would be his spot. But also it, it could just be more of like an open audition for like, all right, who's going to quarterback the second power play unit because McDonough's not here anymore. Right. We did have a comment on yesterday's video that I wanted to address. One of our listeners says, it seems like Joachim Kemmel has been lost by the Predators. Really no updates on him. And I, I kind of wanted to touch on that and, and also get your perspective because I think that this is – a really great example. Kimmel is a really great example of how things have changed with the additions of Stamkos, Marcheseau, Shea, how the timeline for the Predators has changed. And that really may have affected the trajectory of Joachim Kimmel. And I don't think it means that Nashville is not super high on him. I think it means the pressure's off to get him into the NHL as quickly as maybe we anticipated it would be before these offseason moves. Do you agree? Yeah. And I, I would honestly say that any perceived pressure to get him into the NHL as soon as possible is really maybe 
outside pressure, you know, from fans, from media, et cetera. I don't think internally that there was ever any that kind of pressure to really rush him. Um, but, you know, this organization, this franchise was in a very different place even two years ago with, you know, right. th they didn't have a direction. We didn't know. So it was like, OK, well, if we don't have a direction right now, then let's look at what we got coming up the pipeline. And so it's not to say that he's taken a step back or that he his trajectory has changed. I think. It's just his trajectory is what it always should have been. Mm -hmm. and we're now, you know, n now it's like, okay, we're okay with that now because we see the present and we see the future and we're not trying to rush the future into the present. So I, I wouldn't say at all that he's been lost by the organization or that he has taken any kind of step backward. I think he's just following a very normal development trajectory and we're just not hearing as much about him because we're probably not going to see him in the NHL this year. And that's, that's okay. That's not a punishment or a bad sign. That's honestly, we shouldn't be seeing him in the NHL this year. Right. It goes back to that. Don't look at Luke Evangelista <laughs> because he's your anomaly on a number of levels, quite possibly. But and I also think you have to remember that Barry Trott's message in his first season was youth movement. And that set sort of this mental idea of what that's going to look like and how that's going to affect these young players. But really now the, the term is serial winners, which is who they've brought in. And so the window has changed, but I don't think that that lessens the value of players like Kimmel or Svechkov or, you know, any of these other players who are a little bit younger that people maybe thought, oh, we might see them sooner. We don't have to. And that's actually great. So yes, speaking of, thing. it is a good thing. This is a, this is a great situation to be in. Speaking of Svechkov, not my favorite situation to be in. Uh, the Predators did announce yesterday that he is week to week, which breaks my heart. Uh, he was out of the rookie showcase for a lot of the time, kind of recovering from some sort of hitch in his giddy up. And now we're back to this. Uh, we'll say upside yesterday, we saw Reed Schaefer back on the ice, which we hadn't seen since he left one of the rookie showcase games with what looked like an upper body injury. He looked, you know, looked great. Didn't seem to be favoring anything, having any problems. So we did see him again. One of the players that we mentioned that practiced with Group A, Zachary LaRue, and we got a chance to sit and talk to Michael McCarron, which was so delightful. Uh, new dad, Michael. Girl McCarron. dad. Girl dad, Girl Michael McCarron. Dad. Oh, my gosh. Just it is enough to melt your heart um, to hear him talk about that. His little girl was born a couple weeks ago, so kind of got that situated before training camp. Um, but I, we got to ask him a little bit about Zachary LaRue because this is one of those players that, you know, you and I have said, I don't know that he's going to make the NHL roster. They're playing him with McCarron and Smith. This is what he had to say about LaRue. He said, it's a huge opportunity for Zach. It's an opportunity for Smitty and I as well to pick up where we left off last season. Zach is putting his best foot forward here at camp and he's working really hard. I think he's more skilled than he may look. He makes small plays. He's fast. He's a smart hockey player. He lit up the playoffs last year for the ads. It's going to take a little while. I think we're still learning where we're going on the ice. Smitty and I obviously have some chemistry. LaRue's learning fast and he can play. If we can play with the same pace as we played last year, relentless on pucks and just frustrate the other team, it could be huge for our line. So again, not saying 100% LaRue is going to make it, but it's very interesting to get McCarron's take on somebody like Zachary LaRue on a line that was so important for the Nashville Predators last year. And, you know, now there's this this hole where Kiefer Sherwood has gone on. Yeah, I think that, again, I go back to what I, I said earlier this week, which is that a lot of training camp is, you know, you already have your roster pretty much set. What you're trying to figure out now is who's the first guy you call up if someone gets injured or if, if something happens. And I think that's kind of where we're at with the guys like the LaRue's and the Willsby's being in that group 
of the, you know, the traditional NHL starters. I think that that's what we're starting to see here because these are guys who could very, you know, feasibly get called up. I just think with the contract situation, you so parson in, is on a one-way contract. I have a hard time seeing him starting the year in the AHL. Um, I, I think that, yes, he profiles well on that line. I think LaRue also profiles well on that line. But again, back to what Mike McCarron was saying, which is that, you know, like it's going to take a little bit of time. It's just, right. it's not that easy. And like, I think that, Part, part of it too, you know, that line, the identity line that kind of drove the offense and, you know, set the pace and the the tone for this team so much last season. And I, I don't mean to say this in a way that's, you know, I don't want to detract from that because they were incredibly important um, to this team last season. Um, really the only ones who can make any noise against Vancouver in the playoffs too. And that's why Vancouver had to go inside key for Sherwood. Um, but I think that ideally if you're Andrew Brunette and the predators, you don't want to have to rely on that line as much as they did last yes. year. Same right. way that you don't want to have mm -hmm. to rely on your top line as much as you did last year. So I'm not trying to, to detract or take away or say like, ah, whoever's on this line, it really doesn't matter because all four lines matter. But I think it's ideally it's less of a, you know, a, an impact uh, move than maybe it would have been last year for, for this line and this team, if that makes sense. Yeah. The one thing I've noticed about Zachary LaRue, and I thought it was interesting that McCarron talked about, like, this is a guy who can make plays. He can win puck battles. He's doing these small little things well. You are maybe seeing some more of those small little things because you're not distracted by the big things about Zachary LaRue's game that can stand out when he kind of gets in the middle of it and, and commits penalties. You're just not seeing that. We really have not seen any sort of wasted energy from Zachary LaRue. It's really all been channeled into on ice performance. And that's been really good to see. So I definitely think that's something to keep an eye on. I agree with you. I think it would be very odd if he started the season here, but he's getting a good look in camp. Another player we talked to yesterday, Mr. Potato Head sat down and chatted with us, Colton Sissons. I love what he said when he was asked about the signings on July 1st. He said he had to keep refreshing his Twitter feed to be sure it was legit. So did we. So yes. did we, Sissy. Welcome to the club. We were like <laughs> as frantic as you were. Yeah. But he talked to about uh, playing with Tomasino and Evangelista, which is a line we've seen with some consistency in uh, training camp. And, you know, I, I really like what he had to say. He's talking about these are good kids. They have a lot of talent. Uh, he also referred to himself as the uncle of the line, which I want to say, call yourself the Funkle because you are the fun uncle, Colton Sissons. You're not just any uncle. You're the Funkle. Um but I, I also love appreciate that, line. that he's I also appreciate that he said uncle and didn't go for like dad or grandpa dad. either. It's like, yeah, no, you're still young. I, I still say cool. this, I say this because he and I may or may not be the same age. So I'm like, yes, exactly. You're still young and fun. It's okay. That's right. That's right. I love that. Well, coming up, we are gonna get ready to celebrate one of the greatest national holidays of the year. It is time to celebrate National Math Storytelling Day. We're going to take a look at some stats that may or may not paint an accurate picture of what is to come this season in Nashville. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Friends, it is the most wonderful time of the year for sports. And the best place to celebrate is with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. NFL fans, you can kick off your season with a big return at FanDuel. When you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats. You can view live play-by-play -play and so much more all on the same page where you place your bets. Plus, you're going to get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets 
guaranteed. Be sure you check out all of the action at FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. Okay, Emma, we've been really jazzed about this. It's probably a little embarrassing how tickled we are about uh, in, uh, National Math Storytelling Day. And I want to give a shout out to one of our regular listeners, Tango Fett 4065 um, because when we kind of promoted this yesterday, uh, he replied on YouTube, in honor of the holiday, all my calculators will be decorated with the ever childish 80085. I mean, I'm here for it. Also, I'm just like, all your calculators, how many calculators do you have? I'm like, now, now this is, it just brings up so many more questions, but yeah. yeah. You know, what is disappointing is that on an iPhone, it doesn't spell boobs. Because it really looks like an eight. Oh, it you actually need looks like, an, like the numbers. Yeah, you need the old-fashioned calculator for it to be really as eighth grade boy effective. But yeah, thank you for understanding how we celebrate this holiday season. <laughs> See, I was always like the good kid. Um, clearly, that it has gone you know, <laughs> very far in the opposite direction. But as a child, I was a lot more innocent. I would, I would type, I think it was... Would it be zero one one three four? And then you turn it upside down and it says hello. hello. And See, that's the difference between an eighth grade girl with a calculator <laughs> and an eighth grade boy with a calculator. <laughs> yep. Nailed it. That's true. Nailed it. Yeah. So we want to talk about some numbers and some statistics and and kind of talk about what could these tell us about next season. And my husband, he he does uh, analytics for a living. And one of his favorite quotes is from Booger McFarland. And he says, statistics are like a bikini. They reveal a lot, but not everything. And I think that that is probably the best summary of some of the statistics that we are going to be looking at right now. So the first one that I think we want to talk through, talking about goals added, you know, uh, it, it, just goals, offensive production, you know, Nashville last season, they were 10th in the league in goals scored. Uh, majority of that, my friends, 36% of those goals came from the top line. Woof. <laughs> like, that's, that's not how you want it to break down. But you know, that's just, those are the numbers. The Predators added 95 goals. If you look at the goal scoring from last season for Stamkos, March So, and Brady Shea. Emma, looking at these numbers, do you think the Predators are going to have more goals or less goals next season? And what may be the factors that affect that? Well, I certainly hope that they have more. I think we all do. Um, and not only that, but more from more sources. We we don't want that that uh, drop off to be quite as large <laughs> from yes. the top four scores to everyone else. Um, you know, like I said last year, Tommy Novak was technically a top five point getter for the Nashville Predators, but the distance from number four <laughs> Ryan O'Reilly down to number five Tommy Novak quite a quite a large difference. So I would like to see them close that gap a little bit. And I think that these new additions should help, hopefully, yeah. particularly on the power play. Yes. The other thing that I think is really important that we're seeing in training camp that I think is encouraging is that it doesn't look like Andrew Brunette wants to touch that Forsberg, O'Reilly, Nyquist line. They had the second most goals of any line in the NHL behind this is not shocking at all. McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Nugent Hopkins from Edmonton. So this was a really hot line. But like you said, you've got to have more than one hot line. So when you add Marcheseau and Stamkos, you know, who had 82 goals between them, it looks like this could be a, a season with even more goals, even more offensive firepower for the Nashville Predators. There are some things that have me a little bit worried, though, you know, because Nashville last season, you had a bunch of players with career years, you know, Forsberg, uh, Nyquist had career year in points, Yossi and Sissons tied uh, their career high in goals. Can they repeat that? You know, March or so, 
you know, career high in goals at 33 years old, which age is not a disease, but can he repeat that? So I think you have to remember that setting high benchmarks is difficult. Repeating them is even harder. Can they do this? I'm a little nervous. Once again, far be it for me to be the optimist here, but take it home, what, girl. What I would say is that now maybe I'm not being the optimist because I'm not saying they will do this, but I'm saying mm -hmm. that in theory, this could happen. Maybe you don't have all those guys having career years anymore, but in theory, you shouldn't need them to because now you actually have in, in again, in theory, on paper, fantasy hockey, whatever Barry Trotz likes to say <laughs> throughout the lineup, you have more scoring. And mm -hmm. so you don't like, yes, of course, I'm not. I'm not going to say like, yeah, you know what, Gus Nyquist, you don't need to score that much. Like, please actually tone it down a little bit. Like, we're, <laughs> we're not saying that. But I think that like, even if he has like a good year, that's not his best year, they should still be okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think there's a, uh, I'm watching closely Tommy Novak because if he is centering March so and Stamkos, which again, this is what we're seeing in training camp, but it is still training camp. Andrew Burnett reserves the right to change his mind, but you are looking at a very different center for both Steven Stamkos and for Jonathan March so in their respective teams that they came from Tommy Novak, you know, love him love him, would give him a kidney, but he is not Nikita Kucherov. You know, he he's not really Jack Eichel, um, but they may not need him to be, you know, this is going to be one of those cases where you're, you're going to have to say like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Do Steven Stamkos and Jonathan Marcheseau make Tommy Novak a better center? Or does that line struggle because Tommy Novak isn't a Kucherov or an Eichel? And that's something that we're going to have to watch. But when you add those two players on a different line and keep that top line intact. I feel a little optimistic that, that the predators could become an even more high scoring team next season, especially this top nine could be what Barry Trotz wants it to be. Again, it's on paper, but on paper looks pretty good. It does. And, you know, like we said earlier, it's, Tommy Novak doesn't look too small for that line. And I don't just mean small physically. I just mean like the, the role, the moment does not look too big for him. Um, at least again, it's early. It's still practice, still camp, but you know, it could be, you talk about the chicken and egg thing. I mean, that's kind of what we had with the Forsberg O'Reilly Nyquist line last year. It was like, well, these guys are really bringing out a new side in Philip Forsberg. Well, but now Nyquist is having a career year. So maybe Forsberg is bringing it out in him. And so it's a little bit like that's, that's the dream. That's what you want in, you know, a, a line mate, a teammate, you know, you want guys who are going to make the players around them better. And I think that, you know, there's definitely potential for that on that line. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to hope for more goals. I, I think that's kind of where you and I are both leaning more goals for the Nashville Predators coming up. We're going to talk about some other numbers. Let's talk about high danger shots and offensive zone time. Today's episode is brought to you by Indeed. Just like your favorite sports team, we are all driven by the search to be better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree. Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed. 
indeed.com slash locked on. Just go to indeed.com slash locked on right now and let them know you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Again, that is indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Okay, Emma, we're going to talk about a couple of other statistics. Numbers, yeah, numbers tell one thing. Again, it's a bikini here. So so let's find out what the numbers reveal and don't reveal about high danger shots. So looking into this stat, not going to lie, uh, I was surprised by this. The Predators were fifth in the league last season in high danger shots on goal and ninth in high danger goals. So, you know, just how that's quantified, there, there is an actual quantification. A high danger shot, it has to do with geography on the ice, uh, where goals are most likely to be scored, obviously, in the offensive zone. A shot is given a value of like one, two, or three based on that geography. A point's added if it's a rebound shot made within three seconds of a block or a, a miss or a save. Um, if it's a block shot, the value goes down one by one point. So when we're talking about high danger chances, we're talking about those three pointers. Um, and I have to say, I I was kind of blown away by this. And then I remembered Philip Forsberg and how he started the year. That guy had so many high danger chances and didn't finish in the first like couple weeks of the season, the first maybe, I don't know, 10 games or something. And then all of a sudden it clicked. And, and I think, okay, Nashville did have some real quality offensive chances last season. Is it going to get better, Emma? I mean, I think that when you're talking about, and, and we talk about this a lot, the Andrew Brunette system, like what is the calling card of the Andrew Brunette system? That's it. That's it. They're putting pucks on net. And it's not just like, oh, just throw anything at the net and hope it sticks. I mean, to, I mean, if you really want to dumb it down, that is kind of what it is. But it's more <laughs> just like... The more you get the puck into those high danger areas and you create those chances that creates, you know, your odds are going to go up, right? If you have more chances, then your odds are better that one of them's going to go in. And it, again, it's not just chances. It's about these high, high danger, high quality chances um, that are, you know, really going to boost your odds and make your offense better. So I think that, and, and you mentioned Forsberg at the beginning, there were a few guys where it, Tommy Novak's another one where yes. you're just like pulling your hair out. You're like, <laughs> he's right there. Yes, um, he's right there. And then you, you see it finally start to click. I don't know how many, it was kind of, I was, well, I was going to say, I tried to joke with him about it. He did not find it quite as amusing as I did, but talking to Tommy Novak last year about, I was like, how many assists are you going to get before you get a goal? And he's like, I know. <laughs> like, it's like, they, they know. But I think that, um, you know, that's that when we saw that, we're just seeing them learning the Andrew Brunette system. So it might take a minute. Now, obviously, all the guys who were there last year are at an advantage because they've played in this system under for a year. Um, you got to get the new guys up to speed once you do. And once it clicks for them, assuming that it does, you know, it might just take a little bit of time. I think you're definitely going to see that, that go up. Yeah. When you look at high danger expected goals for, I love this stat. And again, just, uh, let's hear it for the Swedish meatball, Philip Forsberg. He finished 16th in players in the league for high danger expected goals for, I mean, generating so many great chances. And of course, capitalizing on what 48 of them, not too shabby. Phil Ryan O'Reilly finished 28th. I just thought that was interesting. Um, Tampa Bay's leader, one might think Steven Stamkos. It was not. It was Braden Point. Stamkos was 62nd in the league when it comes to high danger expected goals for. Um, what I think is kind of interesting about this stat is that it could improve based on defensemen. Uh, last season, Brady Shea led NHL defensemen in high danger goals. Uh, Roman Yossi tied for second. So if you kind of get those two cooking, 
this is a number that I think could go up and, and it could be some really exciting hockey for uh, Predators fans to watch with, with uh, the chances that the team generated last year and improvements that could happen. Yeah, absolutely. I'm here for it. I'm I'm here for it. it. All right, let's talk about offensive zone time. This is another one where I'm like, my gastrointestinal system and eye test do not match the numbers. <laughs> but I thought this was interesting. Nashville had the fourth highest offensive zone time percentage last season, only behind Carolina, uh, the Panthers, and the Oilers. What the what? How about that? See, 90th percentile. See, that one doesn't surprise me only because I remember covering the team last year and having that exact thought. It's like, if they're in the zone so much, why can't (laughs) they actually create offense? Um, I'm sure Barry Trotz was having the same thought, which is why he went on a little shopping spree on July 1st. But I think that it's, again, I go back to what's the calling card? What's Andrew Burnett's calling card? It's that. It's puck possession. If you don't have the puck, get it and maintain control of it. And that is where, again, it's not going to happen overnight. Of course, the ultimate goal is get the puck, keep the puck, shoot the puck, score the puck. But we've got to, you know, we got to walk before we can run, you know. And I I think that that's kind of what we were seeing where it was like, okay, we're we're getting the the puck possession piece like we we've gotten that down now let's take it over the over the hump and let's like get to the actual scoring the puck would be nice um so i think that that's kind of what we were seeing is like that very much you know we talk about the pace the the high pace of andrew burnett's system well the reason for that fast pace is because it's you know Everything is done with the intention of regaining control of the puck. If you have the puck, you know, you want to keep it, keep possession in the offensive zone. If you lose the puck, you are hauling your rear end back to the other end of the ice to get it back. And so that's where that pace comes from. It's not just, oh, let's just be really fast and, you know, run in circles and confuse everyone. It's no, it's because everything is done. It's like, it's a race to see who can get to the puck faster. And so I think that, again, not surprising to me, only just because I I covered this team and had, I remember constantly looking at NHL Edge and being like, what in the world? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and right it's, there. <laughs> well, but it's funny as someone like myself who when I used to work for the team and I'm like man that would have been something that I would have been trotting out all the time because you Mm -hmm. you know if you work for the team you can't really say anything negative about them so I'd be like hey that that zone time though (laughs) you know even even if they were losing like 10 to nothing I'd be like hey but did you see the zone time (laughs) (laughs) under under John Hines it was hey but did you see that face off percentage there you go (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there you go. Well, and I think you hit on something that is going to be a big impact in this number staying high for Nashville. And you talk about the board battles. And that was something uh, in chatting with Luke Evangelista yesterday. He talked about like that's part of what turned his game around in that second half. I realized I was giving up those, you know, I was giving up the puck. And if you get people in this system, getting possession back of that puck. The other thing I think is going to impact that is the chemistry and, and building kind of that on ice vibe where there is that instinct and anticipation. I I think you're going to see not only more offensive zone time or continued high offensive zone time, but maybe they're going to do something. Maybe they're going to run Emma. They're going to stop walking and they're going to run in the ozone. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe. So those are just some of the numbers that we are uh, celebrating on this National Math Storytelling Day. It's really hard to convert numbers from last season into next season. We're going to have to kind of keep our eye on these players, on chemistry, on uh, who makes the roster to see how this all turns out. But I would say overall, pretty optimistic numbers going into next season. Would you agree, Emma? I would. Uh, yeah. I would agree, you know, but same thing with expectations. Let's let's manage them. Yes. And uh, just remember 
how long it took some of these guys to pick up on the system last year. And now, you know, we're going to be seeing it with a bunch of new guys too. So yeah. Patience, patience, patience and is, grace. Yes. Patience yes. and grace. That's right. Well, tonight the Nashville Predators are going to have an intra-squad scrimmage over in Clarksville. The Gold Star Showcase is happening tonight. They're going to stream that game on NashvillePredators.com. 102.5 will also have the radio call if you want to check out that action. And again, this weekend, they're going to play Tampa Bay. Steven Stamkos is going home. So that's going to be a whole lot of feels, even though it's just a preseason game. whole lot of feels going on. Uh, so we will uh, talk about what that game could mean and what we may see from the Predators then, too. We're going to cover that later this week. Before we sign off, Emma, let everyone know where they can find you and your work. You can find me on social media at Emma underscore Lingen, and you can find my work at The Hockey News. And you can find me on social media and K underscore Mama on Ice. You can find my work at Penalty Box Radio as well. That is going to do it for this episode of the Locked on Predators podcast. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We will be back tomorrow with an all new episode. We'll see you then.